Liberty friends, what's happening? This is your host of Felony Friday, John Odermatt, coming at you real quick before today's show to give you a very important reminder to please consider, if you have not already done, join the Lions of Liberty Pride. With the Lions of Liberty Pride, we are always giving you, delivering the best and the brightest minds, bringing you bonus content and unique things happening. Everything from watching a little beer pong tournament on the weekend to Conspiracy Corner and Degenerate Gamblers and bonus episodes with our guests. Also, uh, the upcoming, our third Libertarian presidential debate that we're having next week. The last two entrants, yes, the last two entrants were decided by our Lions of Liberty Pride members. We do perks like that all the time, so we're always bouncing things off our Pride members. We have for our $25 a month and up Pride members, we actually have monthly calls and we talk about all kinds of different things, but we also brainstorm about the show and take ideas. We bounce ideas off of them. So it's a great experience. I highly encourage you to join the Lions of Liberty Pride. Go to patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty. Welcome to Felony Friday, a presentation of the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here is your host, John Odermatt. Felons, friends, and freedom lovers, welcome back to another edition of Felony Friday, a weekly show right here on the Lions of Liberty podcast. What is Felony Friday? Felony Friday is a show where every single week we're going to do a deep dive and we're going to examine and expose injustice in the broken criminal justice system. Now, if this is your first time listening to Felony Friday, your first time listening to any of the shows we have here on Lions of Liberty, sit back, relax, enjoy the show, put your feet up. If you're driving, please don't put your feet up. But if you've been back several times, if this is a regular habit of listening, why haven't you subscribed? Or maybe you have subscribed. Thank you if you subscribe. But if you haven't, please do so. Whatever podcasting app you're listening on please just scroll up to the top there punch that subscribe button and uh, you'll get every single episode of the lions of liberty podcast and a felony friday delivered to your little listening device and also if you really enjoy what you're hearing here please think about uh giving us a, a five-star rating and a review on uh, apple podcast especially if you listen there because it helps with the algorithms and all that crazy stuff without further ado let's get rolling with today's show my guest on or my guests on felony friday today are felix walls and allegra walls felix did 25 years in prison uh, for conspiracy to possess with intent to distribute distribute cocaine and conspiracy uh, to launder monetary instruments, for which he was originally sentenced to life in prison. Felix's judge, Robert H. Cleland, uh, he was dead set on uh, not, he was dead set against getting him any relief. And the first time that uh, Felix filed for compassionate release, the warden, the BOP director, and even his prosecutor signed off and approved it. His judge blocked it. Since then, uh, because of this pandemic, Felix's daughter, Allegra, decided to file another motion to the judge. And the very next day, it was granted. And uh, even though the, the prosecutor, a new prosecutor, had vigorously opposed it. And uh, the judge released him. Felix was uh, released from prison, walked free on April 24th. So today, I'm joined by Felix and Allegra Walls. Welcome to Felony Friday. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for, thank having, you for us. having us on your show. And thank your listeners. Yeah, thank you both for coming on the show. And uh, this is this is an important story to tell. And, uh, you know, like you said, the, the listeners, people need to hear this story. So I'm, I'm very grateful that you, you both are you know giving your time. And, uh, you know, I know you just got out. So this, maybe under normal circumstances, if we weren't in quarantine and all the stuff with the virus, there'd be more you could do. But uh I'm, I'm grateful to be able to talk with both of you today. So normally uh, when I, for these interviews, I'll start sort of at the beginning and work my way through. But I think with, uh, with your case, I think it makes more sense to start at the end and then go back. So I, I want to hear from both, both of you on this and I'll start with Felix. Can you walk us through what was going through your mind? What kind of emotions you felt and just, 
sort of just walk us through that day, the day you found out that you were getting released. Well, I did 26 and a half years on this sentence. And when this day, when, when this occurred, uh, my first sentence, initial sentence on this case was 30 years. I got, in a, I got a reversal and then I got a life sentence. Oh. Now, when, when, when I got the life sentence, then I reversed that and I got another life sentence. Oh. So my daughter, you know, I fought this case criminal, criminally all the way to the end. So my daughter filed the, filed a motion. She didn't even tell me that she was filing the motion. She went on and filed it on her own. And after she filed it, I told her, I said, look, he doesn't have jurisdiction because I got this case in the appellate court and I'm waiting on a, a ruling from them. She said, well, dad, why don't you just leave it alone and, and, and let us handle it? So my counselor, you know, he came in two days in a row. He says, Felix, he said, your daughter says that you can get out if you will withdraw all, if you will, will just withdraw your motion from the appeals court. Well, this is the same thing I was told in March of 16, and I went for it, and the judge turned on me, you know, and wouldn't let me out. So I said, no, no way I'll do it. So my daughter, they filed the motions. He granted, he granted, he had granted to accept her motion. Then the prosecutor stepped in and said, you don't have jurisdiction that uh, the appellate court got it. So they filed a motion. My other daughter filed a motion to the Sixth Circuit for them to reverse it back. All of this took place in one day. The lady wow. came to my door, cell 103. She says, uh, she says, where do you where do you want to where do you want to go? I said, what do you mean? Where do I want to go? I ain't asked you to go no place. She said, she said, you don't know. I said, no, I don't know. What is you talking about? She said, you, you, we got to have you out of here in a few minutes. I said, come on, you're kidding. She said, I'm telling you. She said, we got an order that we got to release you in a few minutes. I could not believe this, man. One day, they, they remanded this case and issued an order for, for my release in one, one day. And I've been fighting for 27 years, 26 and a half years to gain my freedom. I'll let her explain to you what she did because, you know, I would have originally told her not to do it, you know, because I didn't trust the judge. Well, Allegra, yeah, yeah, walk us walk us through what you did from from your end to make this happen. So a couple things. One, I went to D.C. and lobbied for the First Step Act two years ago. And at the time when I was lobbying for it, he didn't qualify. So I, you know, gave as many heartfelt speeches as I could to as many staffers as I could. And I was like, it doesn't even, my dad doesn't even qualify, but this makes a difference for families all over, you know, just stating the reasons why the First Step Act should be passed. Just, you know, just shortening sentences, recalculating good time, making sure people are close to their families to visit. I'm like, this affects a lot of people. And one of the staffers from uh, Milwaukee actually went to Marquette and I went to Marquette and she was like in tears because she couldn't believe the story that I was telling. So when, when the whole coronavirus thing came about, I started to freak out because there were cases in Forest City and we were going for a partner commutation and just trying to wait and see what the president would do. And the president does whatever he wants whenever he feels like it. And so we couldn't really bank on that. There was no rhyme or reason. And I had a lot of connections, a lot of people. There were politicians that were signing my dad's change.org petition. There were over 90,000 signatures on there. There were people reaching out with all kinds of political connections that were like, I can help you. You know, I put a status on Facebook and I have 5,000 friends and people were just coming from everywhere. Like, I can help you do this. I can help you do that. So we thought we had something impactful going. And so what came to me was, did I do everything that I could do? And I was like, well, I didn't ask. So I put in a motion to the judge and I, I signed it with my power of attorney and was just like, can you let him out? These are the reasons why this is where he is health wise. 
and we need him to be home so that I can take care of him and he can be safe. Literally the next day, so my dad called and I was like, hey, just so you know, I put in a motion with the judge to ask for compassionate release. And he was like, he's not going to grant it. He was like, you already know how he is. And I was like, dad, and he was like, okay, I'm not even going to say anything negative. I won't even put that out in the universe. He's like, but if this motion, if he accepts your motion, you got to go to law school. And so I said, all right, fine. So the next day he didn't call. Just What were your expectations when you filed the motion? Did you have a good feeling or were you just, just trying anything? Um, I put some prayer and some good energy behind it. Mm -hmm. And I, I did have a good feeling. I didn't know what to expect, but I just, I had a good feeling and I knew I had to try. Mm -hmm. And so he didn't call the next day. So he had been calling me every day. Like they would get out for like 30 minutes. So he would call me and be like, what's the update? Any news? You know, that kind of thing. And so I would give him a little mini update. Like, well, this politician wrote a letter and this politician did that. And this person did that. And we weren't getting anywhere. And so when he didn't call the next day, I'm like on edge all day. So the next day it was about noon and I saw dad go across the call ID and I was like, oh my God, oh my God, okay, calm down. So he answered the phone or I answered the phone and he said, um, you know, hey babe, how you doing? What's the update? And I was like, what law school do you want me to go to? Because the judge had accepted the, the motion and was extremely nice about it, which he had never been. I mean, like almost a tyrant on the bench, okay? I mean, just gave me every concession in the book and accepted it and was totally fine with it, said he wouldn't stand in the way, put it all in writing, everything's fine. So he says, I don't know, I gotta meditate on that. And I was like, don't you wanna know why I asked you that? And he was like, he accepted the motion? And I was like, yes. He was like, oh my God, I can't believe you did it. And I said, yeah, we just have to wait on the prosecutor to respond. Mm -hmm. So at this time I'm in communication with the clerk and she's like, the prosecutor's just gonna rubber stamp it. Everything's gonna be fine. So I was like, all right, I'm getting on a flight. So I fly down to Fort to Memphis and drive over to Forest City because I felt like, you know, at his age, it was better for him to be, you know, me to be waiting for him than him to be waiting for me to get out. Mm -hmm. And so I'm down there and nothing is moving. The prosecutor has not responded. Um, we're all, we're just freaking out. Like, we don't know what's happening. Nothing is happening. So at the same time, we find out it's got to go to the court of appeals. The prosecutor finally responds. It has to go to the court of appeals. And I'm like, oh my God, the court of appeals takes forever to do anything. So it's, it's Wednesday afternoon. And I spoke with, cause I have a, several sisters. So I spoke with the the clerk of courts at the court of appeals. And she said, basically off the record, don't pull this motion because if you pull it and he does the same thing and says, no, then you're screwed. And she said, and also she's like, if you do pull it, it's going to cause some cross communication and then they're going to have to examine why you pulled it and before they can answer. So just leave it there and let them answer the prosecutor's motion. So at the same time, one of my older sisters is calling the prison, telling them to tell my dad to pull the motion. So my dad ends up calling me and I'm like, don't pull the motion. Like we're not pulling it, leave it there, right? So we have like all this stuff going uh -huh. from different directions. I'm like, absolutely do not pull this motion. So my dad is like, okay, so now what? And I'm like, I'm calling in favors. I'm, we're gonna see what we can do, but I have to go home in the morning because I gotta go back to work. I'll come back as soon as they, you know, as soon as everything's good. So he says, just stay one more day. And in my head, I'm thinking like the court of appeals takes forever. I can't just hang out in hotels, spending like $300 a day, waiting and waiting and waiting. Mm -hmm. I'm like, dad, I'll come back. So I fly out for a Thursday morning. I fly back home because we're in Milwaukee. I fly back into Chicago. I pull up in front of my house and two things happened at the same time. Number one, my brake light came on <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> Number two, I get a call from the clerk in Michigan and she's like, hey, just wanted to let you know, I got it back. They're issuing the order for release and I'm filing it right now. I'll email you a copy. And I was like, wow. oh my God. So I was like, okay, okay, this is good. <laughs> so at that point, I'm like, I run in the house, dump out my suitcase, throw some more stuff in it and I start looking for flights. So I realized that I can't drive back to Chicago because my car needs to go straight to the dealership, right? And the soonest flight that I could get was at like 6 a.m. in the morning. 
So I call my brother and I tell him that he has to meet me at the Mercedes dealership at like 3.30 in the morning and take me to the airport in Chicago. He doesn't do things like that for people, right? So he's not the person you call to take you to the airport. But he was like, okay, no problem. So I get there. I ended up having a layover. So he's getting released at noon. My flight doesn't land in Memphis until 12, 13 p.m. So at that point, my older sisters had driven up from Texas to, to meet him for release. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to be there because I felt like, you know, not like I want like all the credit, but I'm like, I got this ball rolling. Like I deserve to see him walk out, but there's nothing I can do about it. So I just was like, I prayed about it. I was like, I meditated. I'm, I'm going to see him walk out. I can envision myself being there. I'm going to see it happen. So I drive from Memphis to Forest City, which is an hour and two minute drive. While my family is on, I, on my iPad on Zoom, and I literally, I'm counting down. I'm like, I'm 20 minutes away. I'm 17 minutes away. I literally pulled in the parking lot and he came out less than two minutes later. He should have been out the door at noon and he didn't come out until like two something. And he couldn't even really explain what took him so long to come out. He was just like, well, I was just trying to make sure they had everything. Who cares? 26 years, I would have been like, keep on at him out. Like, See ya. <laughs> yes, but not him. So... He's, he was making sure all his legal papers were intact and all of that. I would have been like, burn it. I don't care. <laughs> so I got to see him. I was the first one to him. I jumped out and ran. And it was such an amazing moment. Like, it was such an amazing moment. So, yeah, it's been quite a whirlwind since he's been home. After, after the, um, now keep in mind now, this is a judge that said that I would never come out of prison alive. The judge actually said that. Oh, yes. He said that a number of times. Every time he gave me a life sentence, he told me, he says, you think you're smart, but you would never get out of prison alive. Wow. And he gave me, he sent me to life two times. And this was after I had already been sentenced to 30 years and I got a reversal. So when I got the reversal, he says, well, you think you're smart. He says, but you're gonna get you're gonna get more time this time. <clears throat> so he gave me a life sentence. When I got released, he added five years to the uh, to the life sentence. So now he wants me to report for five years. So can can you walk us through? So your your original sentence was thirty years, and you appealed it. You appealed in one. Yes. And then you, so how did you get another, how did you get a life sentence from, from that? How, how did that? How, what happened was the first trial judge, his son was my business partner in a gambling casino deal in the Bahamas. And I didn't know this until, <clears throat> until later. The judge was so mean and, 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 you know, it was unbelievable how mean he was. So when I prayed on it, God said, it's, say he's in, he's in partners with you. You're in business with him. And I said, God, I can't believe that. So then about after I got convicted, some people started coming forth and they told my lawyer that the judge's son was involved in a gambling casino deal with me. So after I got the reversal. This is the same judge, Judge... Cleveland or a different different judge different judge okay judge Cohn was the judge then then I they had to give me a new judge because that judge could no longer try my case the court of appeals told him to to resign from my case so then they gave me another judge from up in Saginaw Michigan so I figured that things might be better with this judge then in 18, I finds out, in 2018, I finds out that the judge that had been on my case for the last 20 years was an intern prosecutor against me in 1965. So he was, he could he kept it secret. He didn't never let it out that he was he was my judge before. I mean prosecutor before. Huh. So he was very bitter. 
He ordered the jury to convict me when I had the jury to the point where they were ready to find me not guilty because in, he forced me to argue, to, to, to try my own case. My mother was in the hospital. She had just went into a coma when she found out I was going to trial. So I told him, I said, look, man, I will plead guilty to the indictment. I'll plead guilty to, to the guideline. So he said, no, he said, I'm not going to let you plead guilty. 98% of the people in federal court plead guilty. But yeah. he said, I'm not going to let you plead guilty. So now when he's trying the case, I put my argue, closing argument before the jury. And I asked them, you know, very simply, uh, base argument, would you convict your mother, your father, your son, your daughter on this particular type of evidence? And they were saying, no, they were breaking their neck, shaking their head, no. So he sees them do this and he orders them to convict me. So 10 minutes after a 12 day trial, the jury come back and find me guilty. So when you say he ordered them to convict, he addressed the jury and said, this man should be convicted or something of that nature. He said, he said, he said, I'm, I'm ordering you to disregard the last 15 minutes of his closing argument wow. and just find him guilty. He had his uh, court reporter to keep that last part out of the transcript. They deleted that last part. So the jury oh, came back in 10 minutes and convicted me. So and he, go convicted ahead. You, uh, convicted you and you got a life sentence then? Is that Yes, is that convicted me for a second time. But let me tell you what they did. After I came back, right, I filed a motion to be for my case to be dismissed because the indictment that they charged me on didn't charge a crime. So after I, I showed a, a, a vigorous argument that it didn't charge a crime because they never put a drug amount in there and he never charged me on the 841B with a penalty. So I argued that there was no crime charged in the indictment. This is seven years later, five years statute of limitation on the indictment. After five years, you can't go get a new indictment. He allowed the prosecutor to go get a new indictment. So now we got a, a whole new trial on a whole new indictment after seven years. Now I done been tried on the one, right? So now we got a whole new indictment that they trying me on. So I said, well, judge, I see you're trying me on five or six cases at one time. You know, I said, and, and, and four of them is without an indictment. So he said, he said, well, that's how we do things. And kept right on trying me on this case, man. And he ordered the jury to come with a verdict because there was no drugs. So when I argued to the jury, I said, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, remember the lady what went around saying, where's the beef? I said, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you, where is the listed chemical in this case? Where is the government chemist that get on the stand and testify that this drug is certain amount? I said, there's no chemist that's on the stand to tell you what type of drugs this is or what I'm charged with or anything. And that's when the jury said, well, we don't really have no jurisdiction to try this case. I'm looking in their face and, and they is really looking at the judge saying, man, what are you doing? But he put so much fear in them that they were scared. They were scared not to bring a verdict of guilt. They didn't know what he was going to do to them. So, you know, this is, this is, this is what happened in that. So when I went for sentencing, he said, well, this is only going to take about 30 minutes. I argued my case all day long from nine o'clock in the morning until four o'clock. I was arguing my case before sentencing. So he had to cancel all his case and it was about 10 or 15 lawyers in there 
and not one lawyer would leave. They stayed in the courtroom or they say, we want it, we want to hear this. So not one lawyer left. And uh, after after we finished, after I finished and everything, he imposed a life sentence. So then I appealed that and they reversed that. And I went back again, he gave me a life sentence again. Then when I went back to the appeals court, they affirmed with no opinion, one line, you know, the defendant raised many issues, but none have merit. So they mm -hmm. affirmed the judgment in spite of the fact that after seven years, he went and got a new indictment. And when I got, when I, when they sent me back to prison, they started a whole new timesheet for me. And when they started the new timesheet, they gave me all the time that I had served as jail credit to cover up the fact that I had once been tried, convicted, and sentenced on this case. Huh. So the whole sentence was, was contemplated on relevant conduct. If there was any relevant conduct is if there was any evidence at all. And that's what, that's what guys are getting life sentences on. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. Oh God. It, and see, most people, my lawyer was telling me that this, that my case was the first case. But when I got to prison, I found out that it wasn't the first case. Mm -hmm. That every case come up there is based on, your sentence is based on relevant conduct, if any evidence at all. And they getting life sentences, 40, 50, 30, all types of sentences they getting just on that alone. No proof, no evidence, no trial or nothing. Were they all were they all drug cases? Yes. 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 Let's take a real quick break here. I want to tell you guys about an awesome libertarian podcast. I know you guys think that Lines of Liberty is the only libertarian podcast out there. And we are great. I mean, it's awesome. <laughs> but we do here at Lines of Liberty. But there's other good ones too. In fact, there's a great one called Good Morning Liberty. It's hosted by our friends, Nate and Charlie. They've taken on the onus of trying to change people's minds of how people view libertarians. And they're doing this by leading with a message of compassion first. They're looking at the way in which policies impact people and using the principles of liberty to provide compassionate solutions. I know it's amazing, right? So much more effective than just typing loudly and screaming to yourself and commenting on Facebook statuses. But they're actually giving you tangible ways to talk to other human beings about how liberty is compassion. Amazing, right? So Nate and Charlie are two great guys, like I said. I think I said that at the beginning. They have a, uh, a background in healthcare. They actually own a healthcare IT company. So at times like this and times of crisis, uh, that we have in this country right now. A great podcast to tap into to get their perspective. You can check it out five days per week. So if you need that uh, daily hit of liberty, please check out Nate and Charlie over at Good Morning Liberty. Of course, you can find it on all the regular podcatching apps, or you can just go to lol.gmlpodcast.com. Good Morning Liberty. Check it out. So uh, Allegra, as, as all this was going on, um, you know, him appealing and getting a life sentence and then appealing that and going back and forth with these judges. What was it like for, for you and your family, um, you and your siblings to, to have to, to deal with this? When someone is sentenced to a life sentence, their family serves it with them. And arguably, I think sometimes the time is harder on us than it is on them. Um, That's true. I can remember being 15, 16 years old at my kitchen table typing briefs for him that he's written on yellow legal paper in pencil and I'm trying to decipher what's what and, you know, just doing whatever I can. And so it's been a long road and, you know, we stuck it out with him. Um, but it's, it's been rough. Um, I lost my brother, lost my mom, you know, and these are things that he should have been there for. And maybe if he had been there, things would have been different. 
And so, it, it, you know, they're literally mm -hmm. taking black and brown people primarily away from their families and out of their communities for, and they can't even prove it. So, and that's the thing, like there was, you know, there were people that got on the stand and said, you know, cause it was conspiracy. So there were people that were like, well, I carried, I think there was one, one person that said I carried eight kilos through the airport. And it's like, do you know what eight kilos is? Like, if you, can you really strap eight kilos to your body? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, let's yeah. think about what that looks like. And they just took it all at face value, just whatever it didn't, facts didn't matter. The law didn't matter. None of it matters. And so if they can't get these people you, testifying, these, these mm -hmm. ghost drugs are getting reductions in their sentences. Yep, exactly. Getting to go free. Yep. Not yeah. just a reduction, they go yeah. home. Yeah, God. And, so, and, and that's what's being done. I, I didn't mean to cut you off there, like, we're sorry, you can. No, it's fine. Continue. Um, but that's the reality though. It, yeah. that, that's, that's the name of the game. And so it's not even about, you know, police work, detective work, um, reality or anything. It's literally about, okay, who can we get to tell? And we'll just use that and that's enough. And it's a really ugly system that's been created. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it, was, it was rough. But I think all of those years of typing briefs and filing things with the court, because they all, they know me. They know me very well. He even wrote in there and he was like, yep, I'm very familiar with Miss Walls because she has filed a number of things on her father's behalf. And he was just like, but this time I'm going to accept it. And so, you know, it was shockingly different. Um, the material difference here, I think, was he was sick of my dad. My dad was sending letters to every senator. You know, like he, I mean, everybody kind of had a an eye on him and knew what he had done. Um, so it was, it was uncomfortable for him. And I think he was looking for a way out, looking for, you know, if I think if my dad himself, which he was so, so stubborn, he wasn't going to do it. But if he would have petitioned the court, he would have, I still think he would have released him. But it just felt that much better for the adversarial situation for it to be me coming rather than my father, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think and that sense. so he was, I mean, almost syrupy sweet to me in the response. Like, I was like, wait, what? Who wrote this? <laughs> so, yeah, it was, and I it guess was shocking. He, he could look at it as that he's he still had an out because he was probably thinking in his mind he's using the pandemic as his, his exactly. reason to justify it. Exactly. Keep in mind one thing, that that she was nine years old when I went to prison. And... Man, all my daughters, man, they, they was real warriors. They stuck it out, man. And I'm talking about, you know, not one time did I call home and I say, I love your neighbors. They always say, I love you more. And I'm talking about this is for 26 and a half years. You know, they never gave up and they never stopped helping me to fight. That's and that's why I'm saying that, you know, everybody's family get behind the situation and they say the wheels of justice turn slow. But if you get, if your family get behind it, you can get out of prison, you know? And I created a, a foundation since I've been home called SAR, Sense of Direction. And I want to put together a program called uh, Adopt a Prison because this is something that will help. And as far as recidivism, I think that it will cut it down 75% with this program because you will have the community, the church and everything involved that's adopting this prison. And it will make a great change in the system. They spend in 80 billion a year. So why not spend it to the community and allow these people to do the monitoring, you know? So, so what's what's your vision for the program that people in the community would um, would, would create a house, mm -hmm. would create a, a safe house for these type of individuals, the prisoners that they adopt, monitor them, help them to find jobs, help them to get back into the community and everything where that they can be a responsible person. Mm -hmm. uh, this program if we introduce it into the prison, put together the proper training programs and everything, 
like I say, it would be 75% less recidivist with this type of program because the community is involved in helping this, this individual to get back, get his life back. And you're going to know the type of individual that you're bringing out of prison. You got the lifers program, you got the DAP program. These programs are excellent programs, and but they need more than that. And they need the community involved with adopting a prisoner. And once this takes place, you will see a great change in the, in, in the uh, prison system and you will see a great change in the amount of people that's going to prison. Mm -hmm. And you'll see a major change as far as crime is concerned because you have the older guys that can breathe on the younger guys and say, hey man, I would do that. You know, they have somebody, man, that can stand up and talk to them. I, I think that's, that's a great idea. Um, and, you know, th there's so many people that they look at the prison system, they look at, you know, people who have done time in the prison system, and, they, they, I mean, there's a stigma to it. But they, they neglect to understand that by, you know, you know not giving them an, an opportunity to, you know, get a job or to, to rent an apartment or, or do different things, to participate in society, to add value to society, that they're just making things worse, that they're driving people back in the – old habits, which are going to lead to, to recidivism. So that's why I, I, I think, I think your, your idea for, uh, for SOD is, is that the, the acronym? Um, it's, it's just makes sense. It's, I mean, it benefits the community. It's a public safety issue, really. That's right. It really is. And when you think about it, um, the zip code 53206 is less than 10 minutes from our house. And that zip code is where the most incarcerated people in the world come from 53206. And so what that does is it reinforces the school to prison pipeline because they take they take census dollars by bodies and put them into rural white neighborhoods. And then because there's a whole group of black and brown people in a prison, and then they take that money and use it to educate their kids. And then meanwhile, in 53206, you've got overcrowded classrooms, and they're building prisons based off of third grade test scores that are extremely low because these kids are not getting the time, attention, energy that they need from their teachers and the teachers are underpaid. And so if we bring those people back into their communities, particularly obviously nonviolent, you know, drug offenses, things like that, we're not bringing pedophiles back into the community under this per program. So just to, you know, be realistic. But if we're bringing them back into the communities where they can, number one, serve as mentors and guides to young men, number two, bring those census dollars back, which will change the education dollars spent right there in the inner city. It re and then also working with different companies to take advantage of federal programs to hire prisoner, well, ex-cons. And then that way they can have like actual you know, jobs and be able to contribute. And so it really makes sense from a tax dollars perspective. Um, and when you look at, well, I, I travel the world quite a bit, and we are the number one country that incarcerates people by far. Oh, yes, and so close. we behave in such a barbaric state for being a first world country. And so it's really shameful. And then when you look at the prison system around the world and what they do to reduce recidivism, and how they treat their prisoners so that they can function when they come home, we are so behind the curve on this one. Well, with so many things, but particularly in that area. And so it really requires us to reevaluate what the system looks like in order to affect change. See, this is what everybody say, get a, get a, good, ed, get a good education and get a good job. Well, the educational system in America needs to be needs to be overhauled because of this reason because you have people that can't even read and write but they might be they might have a gift that god then gave them that need to be developed so we need training programs that specifically pick out what this person is good at 
and set them up in training for that particular program. And that's what that's what's needed here. Because you got guys, man, I done seen guys do some miraculous things that was in jail that they that they didn't even know they could do. Yeah, so, we have the uh the, the one size fits all education system where they everyone goes through the exact same track, which is yeah. it's the factory education. Everyone's gonna work in a factory line, an assembly line. Mm -hmm. It's it's crazy that we haven't reformed that. And, and it's time to do that, mm -hmm. you know, because if you want if you want to go ahead as a country, security wise, you got to train your people, man. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to train them. You got to let them know, you know, what I mean, if you can do this good, then I want you to do it, you know, and I want you to train you to do it and be the best at doing. It. And that's the whole key. And that's what's not being done. And that's why that all these guys, they go to school, they come out, they watch TV, they see all these beautiful things that everybody else got. And then you set an entrapment for them and they fall right into it. Say, well, if I use, do this, I can have that, you know? But what he don't know is if he used the gift that God gave him, he could have it and have it more abundantly without worrying about going to prison, leaving his kids unprotected, mm -hmm. you know me, without him for X amount of years, because, you know, I lost my mother, father, two sisters, a brother, son, wife, and then my kids was left, you know what I mean, uh, to be tortured by the fact that I was gone. And and you were serving. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but this was it was all nonviolent crimes, right? That's right. It really, like I say, it didn't. They didn't even charge a crime until seven years later. You when when you when you first charged when they first charged me, it was never a crime because he never charged it. But they got a lot of people's in prison like that. It's just that I was able to see the law and be able to learn and be able to point it out. Like the judge told me, he said, he said, yo, yo motions, he said, your motions and, and, and things that you have filed as tall as I am. He said, your file in my chambers is tall as as tall as I am. All these motions that you file. Because they can never understand how I could come up with that much thought in regard to the law you know like when kanye went to uh went to to the president and he asked the president to abolish the 13th amendment everybody jumped all over this man talking about you trying to put us back in slavery you trying to do this and you trying to do that you don't know what you're talking about but all he was saying was once all all the 13th amendment did was legitimize slavery Mm -hmm. If you've been duly convicted, I was never duly convicted. So therefore, you know, any sentence they imposed on me was an unjust sentence. So that's why when he said that, if they abolished it, then we would have to be paid minimum wage in prison. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that they was trying to get around when he made that statement. Yeah, there's a lot of companies using that cheap prison labor yes to profit indeed. a lot a lot more than people realize yes indeed and 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 that's the thing that the public don't realize as taxpayers mm -hmm. and their jobs being taken so before we uh before we end the interview here and i, I really appreciate you both giving your time um just want to give you both both a chance to to speak to um really just this experience and, you know, how, how could other people, um, you know, just, just imagine someone out there listening, cause I'm sure there's people who are listening to this who might have a loved one in prison right now. Um, if you could just, just speak to them and, uh, and give them some hope or some motivation or, um, some, some help in getting through that. Um, from the outside, I'll say, don't give up. Um, to make the process easier, if you are gonna try to apply for a compassionate release underneath the guidelines of the COVID-19 and using the First Step Act, 
Number one, get a power of attorney for your loved one if you don't already have one. Number two, write the motion and just ask, can you release him under him or her, excuse me, under the First Step Act because of the extenuating circumstances that are presented by COVID-19 and list the number of cases that are currently in the prison to the best of your knowledge. Sign it your name and then put POA for whoever the loved one is and just submit it and see what happens. Because the First Step Act removed a lot of the red tape, which enabled us to be able to just file. So it makes it where they can't be like, oh, this isn't perfect, or you didn't do this right, or you didn't cross a T or dot a I. I. Now they just have to accept it under good faith. And so I would encourage everybody right now today, draft up a power of attorney, go on legal Zoom, look online, simple power of attorney, just giving yourself full power of attorney, send it to the prison, they will get it, they'll be able to send it back and then file. That's the most effective thing you can do. And then don't give up on them. Don't give up. What I'm looking at is this. I want to bring about a change. They use the, the Fifth Amendment jury system. And when they use the Fifth and Sixth Amendment jury system, they use that system to help put you in prison. I want to be able to create the same type of community system that will help to say, I want to adopt that prisoner and I want him out. I want to be able to get that same power to the community so that they can earmark when this prisoner should be released. And that's what I want to say to the community. When I put this website together and I want everybody to, uh, to get on board, I want all the ministers to get on board. I want the entire community to get on board because the entire community loses when this man is in prison because the taxpayers are paying this $80 billion a year for this man to be in prison. If he's ex exercising some labor force, let him exercise it in his community and let them monitor him. Mm -hmm. that's, what I, that's what I'm asking the community to do to get on board and let's push this and make it happen because we can and I know we can. Well, I think that's a, that's a great mission and uh, it's an inspiring mission really. And I, I wish you, wish you luck with that. And uh, you know, it's a, uh, it's a sad story, you know, you know, looking out what's, what's transpired over the past 26 years for, for you and your family, Felix, and, and for you Allegra and your siblings, but at the same time, where you are today. I mean, there's, I'm sure there's a lot of people who are a lot of prisoners out there who are still separated from their family. So a lot of guys thank, I left behind. Thank God that you guys are, are back together. So that's, uh, that's fantastic. Thank God. And thank, thank you. Both you. For, thank you both for your time today. Appreciate it. We appreciate you thank too, you man. So much. Thank you for listening to today's show. Another great episode of felony Friday. As you know, Felony Friday is one of three shows we have here on the Lions of Liberty podcast. Of course, we kick off every single week with our Monday show hosted by Mark Clare. It's our longest running program, our flagship program, where Mark interviews leaders in the liberty movement. Every Wednesday, we have Electric Liberty Land hosted by Brian McWilliams. It's your weekly shot of culture, comedy, liberty, swearing, and just, just good fun. Check that out. You can get all three shows by subscribing for the great price of $0 per month. You get everything that we have here. So please check everything out. And uh, if you like it all, please think about consider supporting what we're doing here at Lions of Liberty. A great way to do that is by joining the Lions of Liberty Pride. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty. Another great way of doing that is by uh, following, liking, sharing our stuff on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Lions of Liberty. On Instagram and Twitter, we are at Lions of Liberty. And the discussion forum where all the greatest and brightest minds go to to talk about politics, liberty, everything that's happening in the world today, current events, the Lions of Liberty forum on Facebook, which you can find by typing Lions of Liberty Forum in the search bar at the top of Facebook, clicking search, comes up, say you want to join it, answer a question, bam, you're in, and the rest is just going to be a great journey for you. So check that out. That's all I have for today. 
This is John Odermatt signing off. Always remember to keep your head up and the fires of liberty burning.